Thank you for inviting me to the Emerging Markets Conference in Johannesburg. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. I thought I would take this opportunity to talk about a broader theme, which is the rise of Africa. I think African awakening is inevitable, and I believe with the same breath of excitement and surprise as we found out about China and India, second half of this century will be all about Africa. I will articulate the reasons why the rise of Africa is inevitable and then suggest a recipe for, for what Africa needs to do to become a supercontinent. So let's start the journey. My presentation is titled The African Awakening, Recipe for Waking Up the Giant. If you look at the history of economic growth engines, 1800s is all called the European century with the global expansion of the colonial powers and especially the British Empire, which became an undisputed leader, starting with economics as a proposition, but backed up by politics and military. Of course, 1900 is labeled as the American century and the 21st century is labeled as the Asian century but I believe the Asian century will plateau by 2050 roughly, partly because China will become a very advanced nation just like Japan did. But also there's an aging of the population issue both in Japan and in China, for example, as well as many of the advanced ASEAN countries such as South Korea, uh, Singapore. India also will probably follow through a process but anyhow, I do believe that India will become at least middle income, if not advanced nation. And therefore, the growth opportunities will be in the second half of this century. The last continent that is left to be discovered, to be awakened, is Africa. So the second half will be what I call the African century. Why the rise of Africa is inevitable? There are four or five factors I can tell you. Behind the scene, the main factor is that all advanced countries are aging and aging more rapidly. They don't have a domestic growth. Growth has to come from some international markets. And wherever the new growth engines are, Africa will become much more central, not just peripheral, as a continent, as an economy, as we look into the future. But the other four reasons are that Africa is probably the largest and the most resource-rich continent for China and India. In other words, Asia will become a very key strategic partner going forward. Africa will need as much the Asian economies as Asia will need Africa, which is what geopolitically I'm articulating. And I think that will be very important for us to think about. The resources are out there. The Europeans had more than 200 years of history to do something to awaken Africa, create African economic development, but the colonial mindset unfortunately did not allow them to do that. America had the chance to do it also, but America has not been able to awaken the giant. To me, therefore, the giant will be awakened probably by Asian nations, as I will talk about in more specifics. Second major factor is surprisingly the rise of the brand conscious middle class or all classes in Africa. When you travel in Africa, whether it's East Africa, South Africa, West Africa, or above the Sahara even, all the people are today dressing in more modern clothing, jeans and t-shirts. They have logos. They really don't have the native dress code as they used to have. That's just about the clothing side, but that's true about their food habits, for example. That is true about their maybe shelter habits. And all of them are becoming brand conscious, what I call middle class. Middle class is not that small in Africa, but we have never focused on them. We have focused upon the extreme poverty segment for economic development, social development, or extremely rich people. But the interest lies more in that middle class, which is certainly becoming brand conscious, not making at home, but buying in the marketplace, and therefore what is unorganized sector, unbranded products are becoming branded and organized. 
third key factor in my analysis is that there is a great entrepreneurial DNA among the Africans. It does not matter where you travel. Africans, like many people in the world, are entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurship comes not just from obsession and passion as we think, but it comes from sheer survival instincts. You learn how to improvise in a scarcity economy where resources are scarce, water is scarce, there is no electricity, for example, so you innovate in a way that you never imagined was possible. Affordability, accessibility are clearly the key, key paradigm to create economic growth in Africa, but my view is that I see local entrepreneurial DNA which is going to awaken Africa. Very similar is the entrepreneurial DNA in China that is creating the growth and undoubtedly that's the case in India. Last area, Africa is transitioning from the traditional agricultural, basically feudal society or tribal society into an industrial age. The industrial revolution that impacted the Western world 200 years ago is just about starting now in Africa unevenly some nations like South Africa are quite far advanced. Other nations like Sudan or Ethiopia may be slightly behind. And here are the numbers really to show how big this opportunity is in terms of awakening the giant, not just for its resources, but also for its markets. Total GDP of 54 nations, both above Sahara and below Sahara put together, is about $6 trillion based upon purchasing power parity, which I always like better index because currency uh, rates are all speculative, all decided by other agendas, by central banks, uh, for trade policies, and therefore that's not a real measure. I think purchasing power parity is much more uh, equal in terms of measuring economies. It is $6 trillion. Sub-Sahara nations is four trillion of that six trillion. The average annual growth rate between 2007 and 15 is 4.6 percent. Africa has the size but not the scale. Highly fragmented. Fragmented by country, fragmented within the country by regions, within the regions by tribes, and of course it is not organized. So only way you can create a scale from size is to organize, organize, organize. Institutionalize, institutionalize, institutionalize. Put processes in place, put logistics in place, as we all know. The growth rate ranges surprisingly from minus 1.4 in Central African Republic to 10.5 in Ethiopia. This is surprising to me because I didn't expect Ethiopia to do that well. The total population now exceeds 1 billion and the GDP per capita in purchasing power parity is 4,870. This is not that small. It is not the lower income people calculations. It is pretty good actually. So I do believe that Africa has again enormous potential. What are the five challenges Africa is going to face like all emerging economies? In one of my papers are art, art, articulated uniqueness of all emerging economies. The first and a major one is market heterogeneity. Within the country, most of these African nations have large base of the pyramid or the bottom of the pyramid for the low income consumers, both in the rural setting as well as in the urban poor setting. Shanty towns, uh, slum areas, etc. And of course, between countries, there is a significant market heterogeneity. Second one is that most of the markets are governed by socio-political governments, primarily faith-based and sometimes tribal governments. Third, unbranded competition. It's not the branded companies, multinationals or domestic, who compete with other branded companies, but both of them compete with unbranded competition, street vendors, locally made, locally consumed products. Again, it is unorganized markets and size is there but no scale. Each one is highly fragmented 
in terms of total market power that they have as brands. They're basically unbranded products, actually. Fourth very key problem all emerging markets have is inadequate infrastructure. And I'm talking about the banking system, the financial infrastructure, the logistics, for example, the legal system, and even the physical infrastructure like the roads, the ports, um, you know, airports, whatever you think about. What is surprising is and why Africa rise is inevitable is this whole digital revolution. Nobody imagined cell phones will be embraced by emerging economies. As we know, China is the largest cell phone consumer and user, along with the internet, for example. India is the second largest. Africa will become in the same way a very large market because you do have cellular telephone companies highly organized and having a pan-African uh, footprint, whether it's Airtel on the one hand or Vodafone on the other hand. Chronic shortage of resources, which is a key problem of all emerging markets. Poor supply chain. Supply chains are very long, in fact, therefore very inefficient, both in terms of cost of doing business, the margin addition, but also the delays in the times. There are huge power shortages. Despite having nature bless the uh, continent to a level that's unprecedented, it has never been able to organize and harness the power of nature to provide uninterrupted power and energy, for example. And it may be that they again do leapfrogging as they've done in the digital world, rather than go through the typical power generation, they might go into alternate energy, such as a solar, the wind, for example, or whatever uh, gas, whatever turns out to be. Mother Nature is not necessarily kind. You have constant natural disasters, which again creates a huge problem in terms of disrupting the supply chain. Despite all these things, I'm very excited about the future of Africa. And therefore, I've been articulating and finding out how Africa can be awakened and I've created a recipe of several suggestions and strategies that can be implemented relatively easily, in my view. They're very practical suggestions, and I'll go and show them, all of them. The pie chart lists about 10 separate aspects of these ingredients for which one needs a recipe, and I'll go in each one of them in a somewhat detailed manner. The first major recommendation is that Africa needs to pivot toward Asia especially Japan, which already is significantly present in Africa, especially in the automobile sector, for example. China and India are the other two. And all of them have heavily invested in Africa. And they're investing more and more. The soft power, as well as the hard power, they are enormously present, mostly from Asia. And that's what we need to watch. So pivoting Africa away from Europe, away from America, toward Asia would be very key strategic policy decision. Second, invest in digital Africa. This is very doable. You will have to, first of all, computerize all government bureaucracies. And the cost of computing has become so cheap today, especially in a cloud environment or personal computer environment, compared to what it used to be, let's say, even uh, 25, 30 years ago. The old computer legacy systems were very expensive, heavy capital expenditure, heavy maintenance expenditure. There is no such need anymore. Everything is cloud. Everything is basically variable cost. You pay as you go kind of a notion. And it is already shown that one can actually create digital Africa, such as in, Af in uh, Kenya. M-Pesa is one of those great, great payment systems that has gone beyond credit cards, the credit system, for example, and as much as 30% of the GDP does business on M-Pesa, which is an online payment system. And of course, now we see the rise of uh, something like blockchain, which is about to come, on, come. And I think emerging economies will be the pioneers in using new technologies because you don't have the barriers of existing installed capital in the traditional legacy systems. Third key recommendation is that 
make in Africa. Africa used to exporting raw materials, whether those are industrial raw materials, agricultural raw materials, or animal raw materials. What it has to do is to do more value add in those areas in agricultural and industrial sectors and ship out value added products. It needs export markets. Asia is a great export market. And countries like China and Asia are finding that they don't, do not have any more labor advantage. In fact, not only that, but given the resources and all those things, they are even better off basically shifting their manufacturing to Africa. Just as China was made by American and European corporations who went there to do value add because of low labor cost as well as relaxed labor compliance laws. And therefore, China came out not from Chinese brands, as we think, which is only more recent now, but basically doing work for foreign brands. Africa has that opportunity, but Africa can also aspire to create their own multinational corporations, as some South African corporations have already done. Some of the African banks can do it. It's very possible, but the beginning journey would be to have foreign countries, advanced countries, especially from Asia, come and manufacture their products using raw material advantage, using labor advantage, using land advantage. All three factors of production favor Africa as a place or a destination for making things and then buying it back. Fourth, skill-based education. It is very important that in between the high school education, it is mostly for literacy and the college education, which is much more understanding theoretical principles, etc. What we need is in the middle category, what is called vocational technical training. Germany, of course, is an outstanding example. But more recently, in front of our eyes, South Korea, which was a feudal system, in less than 35 years becomes an advanced economy by investing heavily in vocational technical training, in this case for manufacturing. And I think that's very important. We need to take pride in hand work, plumbing, electricity, whatever they are. And I think that's very important. Otherwise, you have this two-caste system of highly educated people who are cerebrally very strong, but they don't know anything. And then you have this agriculturally based economy. So there is this skill based education is a very key one. And by the way, that also was done in the United States for that matter, following German example about 100 years ago. Export driven economy, as I mentioned. We have to have policy reforms where just the rise of China, rise of India in software, for example, was all based upon incentives given special economic zones to the IT services industries. And there are about five, six of them. Each one of them have become $10 billion corporations out of nowhere in less than 25 years. If India can do it, Africa can also do it, whether it's in services or in products. So you have to have policy reforms and economic incentives for export purposes. And of course, as I said, most of the export markets will be not just Europe or America, but surprisingly, it will be Asia. Point number six, Pan-African infrastructure investment. Infrastructure is needed, but really creating a Pan-African compatibility of standards for railroads, for example, for highways. North America has it, Canada, Mexico, and US. Interstate highways are very similar. Rules of engagement are the same. European Union has done a fantastic job building URail with comp compatible standards. You go from country to country seamlessly, essentially. I think Africa can do the same across nations. So this includes airports, ports, Pan-African railways and highways, and this can be done through public-private partnerships. There is so much of money sitting idle on the sidelines which is not wanting to invest in the equity markets like the stock market or into the private debt market, for example. These are sovereign funds 
They think very much like the World Bank of the world. You have the whole China initiative called One Belt, One Road, OBOR, about a trillion dollar investment they're making in infrastructure. Most of that is sovereign funds. They are not looking for quick returns, but long-term strategies. And therefore, to me, public-private partnership is absolutely desirable, almost inevitable. Point number seven, focus on entrepreneurship. In other words, what can Africa do, pan-African if possible, which can unlock the African DNA? Africa has the entrepreneurial DNA, as I mentioned, and it's a question of leveraging its digital infrastructure. Digital is a platform for creating more and more entrepreneurs, and today that platform is global in many ways, and therefore the African entrepreneurs using digital technology can become global enterprises. If Alibaba can do it from China, Tencent can do it from China, Flipkart can do it in India, for example, I think Africa has a huge potential to do the same thing. Leverage African diaspora. Surprisingly, the size of African diaspora outside of Africa is enormous. Not only the African Americans who were brought as slaves or in the Caribbean Africans, but you're talking about post-independence. Post-World War II, many Africans went abroad for either jobs or for education and have settled. They're all over the world. Nigerians are as much outside Nigeria as inside Nigeria. There are actually African diaspora within Africa. Like South Africans would have people from Kenya, Kenya will have people from Ghana, etc., etc. Greater the mobility, there's a huge amount of diaspora that one can create within Africa and outside Africa. To me, that's a very key factor, leveraging the diaspora, motivating them to come back properly, invest in the country, as Taiwan did. My work in Taiwan in the 80s, for example, was about the SIPA, Scientific and Industrial Park Administration, where Taiwanese Chinese who were brilliant people. They were all scientists and engineers at IBM labs, the Xerox labs, HP labs, motivated them to come back and be high-tech entrepreneurs. And the rest is history. It is the Chinese who, I mean, the single Taiwanese who really have created the Silicon Valley, you know, Shanghai Valley, as I call it in Africa. They are the real backbone in many ways. So then we can learn from other countries how to do it. Point number nine, invest in branding and marketing. That's very important. I think Peter Drucker, as one of the greatest thought leaders, always mentioned that there are only two real functions of business, innovation and marketing. The rest of them are all useless cost centers. These are the only two that create value. We admire innovation in every country. We praise them. We make people who innovate, invent heroes. We do not make heroes out of people who create great brands or great marketing programs. To me, a great innovation without good marketing is useless. Similarly, a marketing without a proper product is useless. So it is the combination that we have to do, but the emphasis has to be more on branding and marketing because many of these countries from Africa suffer country of origin negative bias. Africa cannot be in the business of making quality products, for example. That's a bunk. That was the same thing we thought about Japan in the 50s, South Africa, I mean South uh, Korea in the 60s, 70s, Taiwan in the 70s, I remember that. Made in China, we were laughing stock today, nobody laughs at made in China products. They make all quality products, not just low quality products. And Indian uh, brands have become the same way. They've become world class because they meet the global standards. I think Africa can do the same, but it requires branding and marketing, not only the nation Africa, such as Brand Africa for tourism and products, but actually multi corporations. One of the biggest soft powers of any nation is its brands outside the country. So made in Japan created a respect for Japan. Made in Germany created a respect for Germany. 
many product categories made in Russia is the same thing. Africa can do it also. And the last and the most important element is democratization of wealth, not income. I think economists have argued for income equalization or income uh, imparity, the Gini index. I think there has to be a Gini index on the wealth side. Because wealth perpetuates over time through succession planning, investment. How can we make sure that the wealth is created and distributed across all socioeconomic classes? This can happen with the rise of modern middle class who can not only generate income but also save. Savings is invested properly and all of that creates additional wealth. In other words, it is not the uh, income statements as we call it in accounting but also the balance sheet. And therefore, balance sheet for household is the real objective both by policy and by market process. So let me conclude. Rise of Africa is inevitable and has the potential to become the growth engine for the world, including for China, India, and America. To overcome the challenges, Africa needs to go digital, do value add in Africa on raw materials, invest in skill-based education, focus on entrepreneurship and innovation, leverage its diaspora, and pivot toward Asia. I hope this presentation is useful to the conference and your debates and discussions. And again, I'm so sorry I cannot be there in person. Thank you very much.